Good day, viewers. Welcome to another edition of Cancer with Dr. Denise Ejo, CEO of Commwood Cancer Foundation in partnership with Plus TV Africa. This month, we're going to be looking at quite a lot of things, but let us talk about today. Today, we're focusing on the social psychosocial effect of cancer on survivors. In the house, who have I got? I've got Dr. Elizabeth Akin Adenye. Thank you for joining me. Doc, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Dr. Dennis. You have a lovely smile today. <laughs> no you. stress. Today is Saturday. <laughs> yeah, very nice to have you um, today with us. And we're going to be looking at the um, psychosocial, but let us recognize what July is. July is the Sarcoma Awareness Month. And what is Sarcoma? Sarcoma are uncommon cancers that can affect any part of your body. A key symptom of sarcoma is a lump that gets bigger quickly. Most people get diagnosed with their sarcoma when their sarcoma is about the size of a big or a large tin of big beans, a large tin of a lot of things that we have in Nigeria. So that's what sarcoma is, and that's what this month is all about. So somewhere along the line, we'll be talking about that. But today, let's look at the psychosocial effects of cancer, because um, it is a, a very important aspect to the experience of a cancer patient. And without that, we're not going to get very far. So in the house, we have Dr. Lizzie. Who is Dr. Lizzie? Dr. Lizzie is the current president of the Psycho-Oncology Society of Nigeria and a cl clinical psychologist at the University Hospital, University College Hospital, Ibadan. Her research focuses on psychosocial and behavioral dimensions of cancer with emphasis on addressing factors that contribute to advanced stages of cancers and how cancer affects the overall well-being of the patients and the caregivers. As I said, this is Commonwealth Cancer Foundation. We're going to be talking to Doc today and we're going to hopefully have a lovely time. So here we go, Doc. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. I'm going to read something about psychosocials. There is high evidence that people with cancer suffer from psychosocial distress, not only in the early stages following the diagnosis, but during the entire course of the disease. I can aff affirm to that. Psychosocial distress includes many emotional, cognitive, social, and functional problems, which have been documented in many studies across the world. Every 10 years after treatment, even 10 years after treatment, 54% of cancer survivors still suffer from at least one psychological issue. Doc, you're going to be confirming all this for us, but you know, it's very important that cancer patients understand that we are aware. Psychological distress is a significant and ongoing problem for cancer patients. Those living with cancer are affected from time of diagnosis to the end. One thing that is very key that comes up with us is the mental health needs are often neglected as they are not always recognized and properly understood. Welcome to a very interesting conversation with Dr. Elizabeth, who is going to be talking us through this, because a lot of the time, um, cancer is focused on the treatment of the disease rather than every other thing that ha happens to a cancer patient. Doc, thank you for joining me this afternoon or this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you are in the world. We want you to sit back, listen, and let's hear what Doc has to refer to Dr. Elizabeth as Doc, because I really have a good laugh with Dr. Elizabeth. Okay? Or well, I'll call her Dr. Lizzie. So please just understand. It is the Swiss. What does psychosocial mean? And why is it important to discuss when treating cancer patients? Uh, thank you very much. Um... One thing we first want to look at is psychosocial. Psychosocial has two keywords, psychological and social. And so the psychological bit of it refers to um, those aspects that are internal to us. They are subjective. Only us can tell how we feel them. 
And like you've said earlier, they relate to our emotions, our perceptions of issues. Even our spirituality could fall into that psychological because it is subjective, it is internal. The social aspect of it has to do with interpersonal relationships. And that is external to us. It's not within. It's not all that subjective. It has to do with how we relate with others. Perhaps maybe how we relate with our environment better. And so why is this important? It is important to consider the psychosocial issues because the cancer patient is first a human being before he or she is a patient. And as a human being, he or she has multiple parts. There is the social aspect for them. There is the psychological aspect. There is the spiritual aspect. And there is the physical, physiological aspect, so to say. And you cannot take one without considering the other. And so if the focus is only on the physiological impact of cancer, how to control the spread or the growth of the disease or how to kill the cancer, then we may, you know, neglect those other parts that are also integral to this patient. And so there's a need for, how do I put it, a comprehensive and holistic care of the patient. Take care of the physiological aspects without leaving out the social, psychological, emotional, or spiritual parts. Awesome. Doc, I like the way you've actually put it because... Very rightly so. It seems to be a, a, a neglected aspect of our journey. However, in my view, it is not a neglected aspect. It is a key aspect. I always try to say this, and I sometimes maybe maybe it's said wrong or whatever, but I always say to people that the treatment plan of a cancer patient is like 30-40% of what we go through. But a lot of the time, the focus is always surrounded, it's always talked about around the social yes. yeah uh, about the disease rather than everything else which is everything else is us in my view that is everything about us our families our friends so okay so what are the psychosocial aspects then therefore let's be very specific in in of the cancer patient okay let's let's look at a typical human being so that the cancer patient is a typical human being and so this um person is a father, a mother, is a parent. This person works in an organization or is a business owner. This person has a relationship with a God that he or she recognizes as supreme. This person lives within a society and a culture that um, defines how their perception of health and disease and how it is, um, what do we assess? This person lives in a system where there are policies, there are policies that govern healthcare system, education, all of these together. In fact, policies that, that govern your finances. Do we pay from out of pocket? Are there enough insurance? Is the insurance coverage comprehensive enough? All of these are psychosocial aspects, you know, that are important to the patient. And then look at this patient also as a Physical being with identity. Cancer has a way of also altering an individual sense of who I am. I find patients sometimes asking questions. Why me? Who am I? Because sometimes there's that sense that who I was has been altered by having an experience with cancer, by encountering cancer. And so there are multifaceted aspects to this psychosocial um, issues and how it impacts cancer, uh, cancer patients. Let's, like, for example, the issue of work. When cancer comes in, the patient's ability to continually be at work when he or she should be is, at least for the period where he's receiving treatment, is limited. And there will often be the need to take excuses, even if, if it's for a caregiver, because the cancer does not just affect the patient. It also affects their loved ones. And so, as I, you know, I've, I, I've met parents, especially mothers. They are working in an establishment. Even while they are working there, they are thinking about their child in school. Maybe they will soon get a call to say your child is having so-so-so and so -so 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 symptoms. And then another journey to the hospital, to and fro. And they will be taking multiple excuses from the place of work. If it's a 
government establishment or a private establishment, there's often the concern of, is it not better you could go resign and go and be taking care of your, of your child or your loved one? And so the, the impact of cancer on a patient's life, and not just the patient, because oftentimes the caregivers are neglected. The caregivers are actually unseen patients. And so the, the impact is far reaching that a 30 minutes program may not be enough to talk about it, but it's just important to know that these problems are there and they actually need to be addressed. Thank you, Doc. Um, you know, you've just hit a lot of key points on why this conversation is even taking place because a lot of people have put us put the, the us in a box, the disease in a box, our well-being in a box, our social, you know, everything. We're now boxed up and we don't even realize we're boxed up. So everyone, let's take a break now and we'll be joining. We'll be back in a few minutes to continue this conversation with Dr. Elizabeth. Um, I'm hope, I hope you all sit back, watch while we take a quick break and we'll be back in a few minutes. <music> Welcome back, everyone, to this conversation on the psychosocial effects of uh, on cancer patients um, of the disease. Um, I want to thank Dr. Elizabeth for being with us. And just a quick recap on what we've been talking about, the challenges that cancer patients face that are not necessarily all about the treatment, but actually the person that is carrying the disease. So, Doc... Back to you again, and I'm going to give you your next question. And thank you for sitting and joining us. Everyone who's watching us, this Combo Cancer Foundation. You can actually follow us on any of our social media platforms. What is a psychosocial support? Or what is psychosocial support for cancer patients? Specific, like what is the support? Well, psychosocial support or the support for cancer patients would refer to any form of assistance. A patient can um, have access to. And the assistance may come from different angles. Oftentimes, the family caregivers are the first, you know, online to provide the support. The healthcare providers are there. They should provide the support. There should also be community agencies, churches, mosques, I mean, religious centers, um, community um, organizations and NGOs, non-governmental organizations could be there to provide the support. Friends and loved ones could be there to provide these supports. And these supports can be of different types. They can be um, instrumental, in which case they are tangibles that these patients would need. They are practical things that these patients could need. It could be money, it could be assistance, taking care of the children or running errands or transportation to the hospital. And the support could also be emotional. I mean, having having um, an ear, you know, having someone listen to you, having a shoulder to lean on when you are when you are in, you know, in a tight corner where you want to talk and things like that. So the support can be diverse. And oftentimes I'd also say that the support is the kind of support that the patient needs is what the patient needs. In other words, sometimes we may feel like we know what the patient needs, but the best thing is to ask the patients what they need and how they would love that need to be met because we can never understand the need like the patient that is experiencing it. Thank you, Doc. You see, you made it very straightforward because key point, everybody tells us what we need. I just don't get it. <laughs> we, and sometimes people don't understand that we then shut down because you are telling us somehow you're not listening. So we get to a point where we say, okay, you just you can keep talking. And that's because people are not listening. Sometimes it is honestly about how do we get to the hospital? Or I don't feel like eating this. And then you are told, no, they say this is the best thing. However, that best thing you are offering me I'll throw up. So why are you trying to force it down my throat when it's not working? I don't know. I, I thank you. Thank you for bringing this up because it's very important. What is therefore the best psychological, is that how they put it, therapy for cancer patients? What would you say is there the is best? No, there is no There's one no cancer at all. There is no best. It's like asking what is the best treatment for cancer? There is no. Because actually it depends on what this patient is presenting with. That's so the same thing with um, um, psychological support or social support. But so, you know, a patient borrowed me a word, which is what I want to use in one of our sessions. 
the patient said that irrespective of the kind of treatment you are receiving, you must have self-therapy. Irrespective of what any other person is telling you, as a patient, what are you telling yourself? Yes, that is very, very important. Your, your internal language, what, what you are saying that other people are not hearing is very important. But with regards to um, the best type of psychotherapy or support, it all depends on what is this patient presenting with. And so you may have um, a patient that is just about to be diagnosed. The patient is anxious. He does not really understand what's going to happen or what is happening. Well, for that kind of a patient, a psychoeducation may, you know, come handy for that patient in, in terms of preparing the patient, asking the patient questions, letting the patient know that if this, then there are X, Y, Z that can be done. So hope is not lost. Don't just, you know, reassuring the patient of um, the experts that are available, the resources that are available to help this patient go through the journey. We may also have patients that are at the end of life. And they are struggling with existential issues. They are wondering what's next. How do I survive? Um, and issues like that. So you could have existential psychotherapy, for instance, that would be there to help them um, through their hard questions, the questions of aloneness, meaninglessness, the question of death and dying. You could have someone there, experts really, to explore this. Um, issues with the patients. One thing we want to know about um, psychotherapy or psychosocial treatments for cancer is that the therapy may not be able to cure the cancer, but it makes the journey easier for the patients. You know, the struggling. You know, when we're talking about food, I mean, not wanting to eat something and things like that. In the context of therapy, you are able to educate patients about what to eat, what not to eat, and even the emotional role that food plays is the psychology of eating. So there's the emotional role. There are times when, yes, we know that certain things are not okay to eat, but at this particular point, this patient is ill, has no appetite, can't t t tolerate anything, and is asking for something that, that we would say, oh, that's not healthy, don't take it. It's not at that point we say the patient should not eat it. A part of support you can give or a therapy is play along with the patient. Flow with what is on ground. Let the patient take something in, be strong enough, have, have the necessary energy, and then you go on. And so sometimes the kind of support or the kind of psychotherapy that patients need is supportive psychotherapy. Meeting the patients where they are and just going with them as new things unfold, tackling each problem as they unfold. Thank you, Doc, because uh, you see, that's one of the reasons why I actually like this conversation, because it's not a one box fits all. There are no straightforward rules about how we go. Um, I think a lot of people have missed the point that we also have the occupational therapists, the physiotherapists. You know, everybody has put us in this box of just the disease, but the occupational therapists, a lot of people don't even know, for a lot of cancer patients is a requirement. Because with time, we may not be able to walk properly or, or, or use our hands to even feed ourselves. So people don't realize that. And, and I think it's an important aspect that needs to be looked at. So what would you say? You brought up something that was, that interested me just now. You said something about end of life. It's a no-no area in low-middle-income countries, especially countries like Nigeria. However, it is an important part because on the cancer journey, nothing else is promised anymore. How do you get through to families? Because if, if, if there's no preparedness, especially young families, children are, are really, really in a very bad place. And somehow it is not addressed. Then what happens? How do you deal with that? Or how do you help the families, especially those with young young or middle-aged adults? Those are in school that require, yeah. I think you get what I'm trying to ask. I do, I do. 
Um, personally, what I do is I try to be um, empathically frank. So I'm frank. Um, I tell them what is as is, but with empathy. In such a way that we know what is, but it's not as if you are rubbing salt into the injury. As you are presenting this, you are also explaining the rationale for X, Y, Z. I'll, I'll speak particularly, say, in terms of pediatric cancer. And you have a child with cancer, and the parents are there in a dilemma, wondering whether to sell X, Y, Z to cure this child of a cancer which is already advanced and most likely incurable anywhere in the world. And so a way I'd normally approach it is ask the patient or ask the parent, because oftentimes with pediatric cancer, the parent is like the focus of intervention. You want to ask the patient, what is it they know about this condition? And would they want to have more information about this before they go ahead and sell whatever it is you want to sell? And so having clear that they want to know, have more information, I'll tell them plainly, in a situation like this, only one out of 10 will survive. We don't know who that one is. And that is why I wouldn't say give up caring for your child. But you have other children. I would not say sell all you would use to take care of them to support this child. I mean, to treat this child for a disease we are not sure can be cured. You know, one out of 10. But in the meanwhile, show this child love. Be present. Create memories that would outlive this child right now. But don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about this child will soon die. As long as this child is still breathing, this child is still breathing. Engage. Actively engage as much as the child is able to engage. And same can apply with adults. Adults having younger children, I mean, a, patient, a cancer patient having younger children or grandchildren, engage with them in the way you can. Because that is one of the, create, one of the ways we can create meaning in life, despite cancer. Once there is cancer and the patient chooses to withdraw, to disengage, then there is a problem. But even when you are immobile, you know, you can't move, you are right there on the bed, even right there, you can engage, you can find a way of engaging with life. I have a patient once who said that uh, at the point she had um, this cancer, it has to do with the truth. She couldn't talk, they thought she was going to die. Even as she was on that bed, she decides what is eaten in the house. She can't cook it, she can't eat it, but she engages. She decides what you go to market to buy, what you cook for her husband, and X, Y, Z. By the time I met her, she was better. She, in fact, I think she was in remission. She could talk and things like that. So being able to engage in life gives you a sort of, creates a sense of meaning. And that's what I try to infuse in patients when they are at the end of life. If, if it is just 60 seconds you have, or 60 months more, or 60 years, ensure you engage in life. And that is what um, a psychosocial expert would help the patient do at the end of life. Thank you, Doc, because that's that's very interesting. A lot of people, <laughs> you, you actually just um, hit a lot of nails on the head because a lot of people don't know why I actually do this, this, this awareness campaign. And if they really realize that, it is out of engagement oh. rather than sit down and feel sorry for myself. Um, for those who don't know, I live with the disease. I have battled it for seven years, seven years in August. And I'm still here thanking God for each day, even though it's a uh, stage four cancer. Well, well, at the end of the day, I, I am so grateful. And I thank you for sharing this because I want people to hear that you have to engage on your good days and your bad days, engage. You, nobody knows tomorrow. No, all our hands, our lives are in the hands of God, and He's the only one that will decide the day we're going home. So why are we dying before our time? Just engage. Thank you. I, I love that word, engage. Oh my goodness, that's my that's going to be my theme now on this topic. Engage. So what, finally, what my next question, my last question is going to be: What next for a cancer patient with everything, especially focusing with Nigeria? Um, what next for me? is that every clinician working in the cancer space 
every family members and friends and neighbors of cancer patients should do the bit. Even the government, the NGOs, everyone should do the bit they can so that living life despite cancer, we can, they can live that life well. That living life well despite cancer will become a norm in Nigeria rather than an exception. That would just be my parting words. That we should all actively ensure that cancer patients live their life well, live their life meaningfully as much as is possible despite their cancer. Thank you. You've actually said, you've actually said it all. I really appreciate it because you were speaking to me as well. I should live well. I should live well. So I am actually very grateful. Those are your parting words. And to all of us out there who are listening, um, that is actually the truth. That is what we have left. And no matter what the world, there are no promises. But one thing is important. Make sure your life has meaning. Once it has meaning, it's not about how many minutes or hours or days or months or years, but it's how useful or how well you served society, served humanity, and made a difference for those around you. Oh, this is an also, I've actually enjoyed this. And as you rightly point, there are lots of things we can ask and talk about. And hopefully I'll have you again on Dr. Elizabeth, because this conversation on um, the psychosocial is very important. It's something that draws me a lot because I have benefited from all your different cat, um, medical That's teams. Really awesome. Yeah, that um, help um, cancer patients. So honestly, uh, this conversation has helped. And to everybody online, I want to say thank you to all of you um, watching us today in different from your different platforms and spaces and on television and on the YouTube channel. Anywhere you're watching, I want to say that together we fight, together we, we win. If we're all together in this, working together, somehow you give us, the cancer patients, um, a lot more strength than you actually realize because we draw strength from you. And if you are sorry for us, then you are weakening the little strength that we have. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. I really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. So everybody following us on our social media handles, you can find the Commode Cancer Foundation on any of them. CCM, uh, Instagram, Facebook, youtube channel this video will be out on the youtube channel as well so everything you will see you can find us share it with your friends share it with family i uh, use it as a tool we don't do this for for just creating the awareness but as a tool to help others doc thank you i you thank can't you imagine it really it really has made my day it really has <laughs> made my day because honestly it's a very tight conversation as you appreciate yeah Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank so everyone, you. you can follow us on, on, on any of our social media platforms, Conwood Cancer Foundation. Together we fight, together we win. We look forward to seeing you again soon as we go on to Let's Talk About Cancer. Let's talk about it, cancer. It's it. You know, it's that disease. Thank you everyone for watching us today and we look forward to seeing you soon. Mm -hmm.